I uh, generally I avoided taking pictures or showing pictures of people here, but I had to show this because these guys are Mongolians. So actually Mongolians. You can't really see it that well in the uniform, but they've got the Mongolian flag on the left sleeve. And those are Mongolians who are here as part of uh, the International Security Assistance Force. Synthetic Panda asked the question. I know you obviously have a lot of questions in your inbox. Uh, not that many, but I'm making each of them take 20 minutes. So I want to give you something easy, I guess. I notice you're doing Romance of Three Kingdoms X. Yeah, people do seem to have noticed that. Which, by the way, is my favorite RTK game. Down. My question, if you could change something about the Three Kingdoms period, what would it be? Uh, now, this one I actually did think about a little, but um, I've read all of the questions before sitting down to record this, but I tried not to spend a ton of time warming any answers, and maybe I should have, because I've been on this forever now. But I did um, think about this one a little bit. Uh, and what it comes down to is that the Three Kingdoms uh, is an era of history... Um, I don't think you can really consider changing major events in history just because you want to see how the video games that they uh, are based on them would change as a result. So <laughs> I had to think about, well, it's the nature of Chinese history, and uh, it's nice I got the Mongolians on the screen. You can pretend they're Chinese while I'm, I'm talking about this. But, um, I mean, the Chinese have this notion of um, the dynastic cycle, and uh, basically, unlike Western culture, most of the great empires of Western culture were convinced they were going to live forever. America, for example, currently is probably the great Western empire, and uh, your average American really hasn't faced the idea, the notion that uh, the American state might eventually collapse. Uh, you might see it in dystopian sci-fi periodically, but that's it. But yeah, in the West, you had like Rome. They thought they were going to be an empire forever. You had the British Empire. Britain's still around, but the empire is obviously gone. I mean, it's not what it was. Um, but the Chinese really never had that. It was sort of understood throughout most of their history that dynasties rise and fall. I mean, that's the first, that's the, the opening uh, line. When you, there's like a, there's a poem that opens the no, the novel, but the, the after you get past the introductory poem, the first line, I think, translates into the empire long united must divide, long divided must unite, or maybe I got those out of order. But it's a, yeah, the empire long um, divided must unite, long united must divide, thus has it ever been. That's basically an accepted tenet of history in Chinese culture. And um, that being said, why am I talking about that? Well, because the novel and the video games have, have actually been relatively neutral, but the novel and most of the uh, fiction in the form of plays and, and, and uh, stuff based on uh, the Three Kingdoms Liu Bei is always painted as the hero, Zhuan Bei, as he is also known. Probably pronouncing that wrong. Uh, he's generally he's the hero. He's he's the guy you're supposed to root for because you know in the confu in the Confucian uh, world um, he was the one with the most noble aims. He wanted to restore the Han, uh, thus repaying the debt that he and all Chinese owed to the Han for the stability that they have provided and nurturing him in his youth and blah blah blah. And, of course, he was a, you know, because he was a distant relation of the Han Emperor, and then it was just and right that he would be the one to rebuild and blah, blah, blah. Now, he's, he's the hero. You're supposed to be rooting for him. But the Han was clearly on its last legs. It was, I mean, it was screwed. The Han was screwed. Uh, and it was time for a change. That's, looking back on it now, that's what we can say. And, uh, therefore, um, I think if you're going to change something in history, what you'd want, what you'd really want to do is, it's a period of horrible war, devastating human loss, what you'd really want to do is end that as quickly as possible and regain some form of stability. So it's tempting to say, oh, well, I would change it so that Zhang Jiao and the Yellow Turban Rebellion was successful, and uh, there was some kind of new age uh, ushered in by the Yellow Turbans. Except that, you know, I don't think it's even remotely possible that it would have been something like democracy in a modern sense would have come out of the Yellow Turban Rebellion. It would have just had Zhang Jiao as the new emperor. Uh, so, yeah, otherwise you could say, like, well, I wish that the Yellow Turbans, after they had been suppressed, that Hei Jin had dealt with the eunuchs swiftly and prevented the Han from collapsing. And the answer to that is that, well, I think the Han would have collapsed eventually. The event that set the collapse of the Han into motion was the, the eunuchs plotting against Hei Jin, but that, you know, something else would have happened. The Han was on its way out. Uh, and then, well, Dong Zhuo was just a, a really awful guy. The Dynasty Warrior games do not properly get across how horrible Don, Dong Zhuo actually was. Um, 
So really, your, your first chance at anything resembling peace and prosperity for the land, you really do have to pick one of the three kingdoms. You either wanted, um, I mean, you could have asked, oh, you want Shao, should you? but really, your choices were, who did you want to see unifying the land? Uh, Cao Cao, some Sun family member or other, you could choose to make Sun Tzu live longer if you wanted to instead of having it be Sun Quan or Liu Bei. And I think really history has told us that the, the best governed of those three kingdoms was, I, I've heard this, I haven't read into it in any great uh, detail, but apparently uh, Cao Wei was the most well-governed area. It was the most prosperous for most of that period. Um, and really, also, it's the one that was going to win before one big event screwed everything up for them. So, the, I meant to keep this short, but I guess if I was going to change one thing about Three Kingdoms history, had, and I'm playing as Zhou Yu, the great Wu hero who defeated Cao Cao at Chirbi, even if the Dynasty Warrior games and the novel itself try to give all the credit to Zhu Ge Liang, it was actually Zhou Yu who won the most important battle of the era for Wu. But had Cao Cao defeated uh, Wu, or it wasn't even Wu yet, uh, none of the three kingdoms come into existence until uh, after the death of Cao Cao, formally, because they're all technically still under the Han Emperor, uh, Jian. But um, yeah, had Cao Cao's forces won at Cherby and Sun Xuan had been forced to capitulate, uh, Liu Bei wouldn't have had any place to run. Liu Biao would have been destroyed. The only forces left in the land would have been Ma Tang and uh, I think Zhang Lu is his name, both of whom Cao Cao ends up dispatching anyway. And then um, that would have left uh, Liu Zhang. And uh, I think we all know how that would have gone, Cao Cao versus Liu Zhang. So... Yeah, as far as bringing peace and stability to the land and easing the suffering of the people as quickly as possible, not that in the Confucian sense he was really the most virtuous guy, and uh, he did some pretty nasty stuff. He was a badass motherfucker, actually. He did some nasty things during the novel to his enemies and uh, even to his, his allies when it was necessary. But as far as like uh, ending the war and bringing some stability and peace to the common people, Cao Cao's forces at Monachirpi, they would have happened a lot faster. Okay. Let's switch the picture again. Here's a picture of a MiG. I don't know what kind of MiG that is. 29, possibly. That's outside of an Afghan base. Uh, I'm not really supposed to take pictures of American military aircraft, but I figure it's probably okay to take pictures of dilapidated Soviet military aircraft. The next question is from Helig's Cat, who says, Hello, what's your reason for LPing? Uh, well, here's one I can finally give the short answer to. I was bored. Uh, I guess a somewhat longer and more involved answer would be to say... Uh, Boba the Vulture was watching LPs before I was, and uh, I was, I had moved into this, the place where I was living before I came to Afghanistan, I didn't really know a lot of people, I was pretty much spending the weekends hanging around on my own, uh, in my apartment, and, uh, you know, LPing was something to do that prevents you from, like, you know, just hanging around in your own apartment, getting drunk or whatever, you know. Just uh, but uh, he was watching LPs, and I want and uh, I ended up watching um, just because for whatever reason, Holy Diver, the song Holy Diver, popped into my head. Uh, really, the reason for that is another long story, but it's um, a radio show I used to listen to when I lived in a different part of Virginia. And uh, they just had this whole thing where the two hosts of this afternoon radio show were just laughing and having fun talking about Holy Diver. Just kind of making fun of Dio and how over serious Dio takes himself sometimes. Uh, and that song popped in my head, and I looked it up on YouTube, intending to watch a video for Holy Diver, and I found uh, Lord Vega's uh, Let's Play of Holy Diver, and I watched the whole thing, and it was really enjoyable. I really, I really liked it a lot. But at first, it was like I saw how long it was; it was several parts, and I watched the first part, and I was like, okay, I'm going to stop. I could not, I couldn't possibly waste hour, an hour plus of my time watching somebody else play a video game. I don't even know them. That's ridiculous. But I got sucked into it. I watched the whole thing, um, some of it while doing something else in the background. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And I mentioned it to Bobo, and apparently he actually was watching a couple of LPers. And um, 
he mentioned Action 52. I, I can't remember how I got to watching it, but the first Kokoski LP I watched was Action 52, and that was just mind-blowing. Part of it was just because Action 52 is such an incredible, mind-blowing experience on its own. Um, and, that was, and then I, I started. I saw that he was doing. He did the Ultimate Games, which I'd always kind of wanted to play the Ultimate Games, but it just seemed like it would take forever to get through them. And that was like the per- perfect for me. It was like, well, let somebody else go to the trouble, and I'll just follow along with the story. So I watched Ultimate Seven and Ultimate Seven: The Serpent Isle, very long and involved LP by Kakoski. And there were points where I was impatient. I was like, come on, hurry up, get on with it, TM. And um, but I still enjoyed it a lot. And uh, as I said, I think in my Seventh Saga, or not Seventh Saga. Um, Tecmo Secret of the Stars LP. That was kind of where I realized watching that that I thought I could do that too. And I decided to give it a try. And I enjoyed it. It was very slow getting started, getting anybody to watch. But uh, I was enjoying recording the videos enough that it didn't matter. So, yeah. Uh, that's basically how I got started. But the question really is, what's my reason for helping? And the answer was, well, I was kind of bored. I, I had some free time and and I wanted to do something with it that wouldn't be like destructive to my health. Uh, and the biggest problem I've got with LPing now is that uh, if you LP all weekend, uh, you never leave your room, never leave your apartment, and uh, you know I'm single and I'm not getting any younger, so uh, it can be uh, hazardous for your health to LP too much. All right, so let's switch pictures again. There's a picture. That's that's a sign outside of the facility where they saw that uh, plane. That's supposed to say uh, regional training center, but uh, it was painted by the locals. I'm sure that the part that's in uh, Pashto, unless that's Dari, I really I couldn't possibly tell you. Uh, which just goes to show I'm making fun of their English, but I have no idea what this language up here is, which of those two it is. But uh, that's probably right. This the locals put the sign together, and they came up with the Riganar Tarning Center. That was my uh, desktop background for a long time. Uh, until I got the new computer. And the only reason it's not the desktop background on a new computer is I haven't bothered to set it up that way. But anyway, uh, e- Egregious Bass. I'm assuming that he's actually uh, somebody who who plays in a band and plays bass. And it's probably supposed to be Egregious Bass. But um, I just much prefer Egregious Bass. Dear the Mysterious JG, when and how did you gain your interest in the Three Kingdoms period? Uh, basically, like a lot of current nerds who like Three Kingdoms, it, it comes from Koai, specifically from Dynasty Warriors 5. Uh, I used to write for a website called Weekly Visitor. I really enjoyed writing for that website. Uh, I used to have a good, friendly relationship with some other writers on that website through chat and stuff, Instant Messenger. Um, that was a, the, the, the website was actually about pro wrestling. We would write and talk about pro wrestling, and we would write... Uh, summaries of the events of pro wrestling shows and we would always it was always in in humorous manner and we'd have like nicknames for the performers and we'd make we have like running jokes and we'd build on each other's running jokes and stuff and before i got there the website was a lot a lot of it was people drawing web comics about wrestling and it was really fun and i don't like to dwell on weekly visitor too much because um when the site collapsed Several of the people who were involved basically blamed me, said it was entirely my fault that the site stopped being fun and that it was all my fault that everything had had ended after a couple of years as a, you know, as a fun but virtually unknown humor website. Uh, it was over. And um, a couple of people came, in, came on to the forums and said it was all my fault. And um, nobody really backed me up and said it wasn't, so I've kind of accepted that it was probably my fault, which is why I'm not doing a hobby where I pretty much uh, am putting out material by myself, and I don't have to work with other people and piss them off. But um, the guy, some of the guys on that website were really big into, into Dynasty Warriors, and uh, so I picked up the game and played it based on their recommendation, pretty much fell in love with Dynasty Warriors. Um, if the question wasn't worded, what was my favorite game that I haven't LP'd, uh, if it was just my favorite game ever, Dynasty Warriors 5 would have to be a contender, just because between Dynasty Warriors 5, forget Empires, between fin- Dynasty Warriors 5 and Extreme Legends, I just got so much play out of that game, it's ridiculous. Professional reviewers always slam the Dynasty Warriors series by saying it never changes, they just keep turning out the same game over and over and over. But other than maybe 6, which I just didn't care for, but I think if I'd never played another Dynasty Warriors games before that, uh, and wasn't complaining about stuff like, oh, why isn't Doc Yowen, and how come Tao P's got a different uh, weapon now, and shit like that. I probably would have really liked Dynasty Warriors 6, too. But Dynasty Warriors 5 and Extreme Legend, between the two of them, I got way more 
gameplay out of that than I spent in cash on it. That is insane how much fun I got out of those games. That reminds me, you should put Samurai Warriors uh, and Samurai Warriors Extreme Legend. Maybe you should go on the list of games I have in LP that were my favorites, because I haven't done anything with those games yet, but I really enjoyed them too. But anyway, yeah, it, it came from Koei. Uh, got into Dynasty Warriors before I got into Romance of Three Kingdoms. Got into Romance of Three Kingdoms before I got into the novel. And uh, once I'd read the novel, then I could start being all douchey and acting superior to people who hadn't read the novel. But um, I did get into it through video games. Chico Homong Kids. Oh, better change the picture again. I like this picture because that guy pointing at me, uh, he he's actually gives me the finger, uh, but I didn't get a picture of that, so you have to stick with this. This is while riding around outside of the wire in Kandahar. Uh, relatively, you know, it could be considered dangerous. There's some people who wouldn't be willing to do it. Relatively safe area outside of, uh, because it was under uh, Afghan National Army control, so it's not like it's really uh, a no-man's land or anything, but yeah, that that guy uh, saw a white guy in the, in the back seat of the vehicle with a camera out, gave me the finger, so I, I enjoy that picture a lot. Uh, Chico Homon Kids says, can you, oh, and I don't think this was meant for my uh, question special, but I'm going to read it anyway because it amused me. It came out while I was receiving questions for this question special. I got an email that says, request, can you do another LP of Romance of the Three Kingdoms 11, but playing as Wu and creating new characters and having the char created characters randomly deploy on the map? Uh, no. Well, I mean, the question is, yeah, if I want to be like a grammar snark, I could say like, yes, but I won't, because the question says, can you do another LP? But no, I'm not going to do another LP of Romance Three Kingdoms 11, or I don't plan to. If I did do another uh, playthrough of Romance Three Kingdoms 11, I think I would have to play as a force that I haven't used before. Um, and since I played as Shu in RTK 11, and I'm playing as Wu in RTK 10, uh, my, if I ever do another um, Let's Play of a Romance Three Kingdoms game, which I, I am not planning on doing, I definitely would not be using Shu or Wu. So that's what he asked, and that's not going to happen. Uh, next picture. Uh, the only thing I really like about this picture is the uh, last sentence, which uh, if you lose that apostrophe, it becomes even funnier. The apostrophe doesn't make sense as it is, but... And this question comes from Kai Gamer, ROTK. I can't remember if I've asked you this before, but are you planning on doing any ROTK, any other ROTK LPs like 9 or 8? Uh, no. I played Romance of Three Kingdoms 8, I believe. I don't know for sure that's which one it was. But I played RTK 8. Actually, I mentioned Weekly Visitor. I went one time, traveled to visit some of the other Weekly Visitor people in person before the site collapsed. Happier days when the site was still going and everyone involved was pretty happy with each other and I hadn't apparently become the evil bastard who ruined everything yet. But we all got together at somebody's house to watch a wrestling event and while we were at his house, we also... Uh, played Romance of the Three Kingdoms, and he had RTK-8. If if that's the one I'm... I think it was RTK-8. It's the one that plays like RTK-10, but it has a multiplayer. Like, you can actually pass the controller back and forth and have different people taking turns and acting. And we really enjoyed that. Uh, and we had a big joke where there was a character whose name was Noble. And... Um, when he appeared, and, and it's like a piece of dialogue, like he would be explaining to you how a facility worked. We well, would talk like this because of Jamie Noble, boy! Jamie Noble was a character who was in uh, World Wrestling Entertainment at the time. So, yeah, that was a lot of fun. But uh, no, I'm not planning on doing any of them. Any of them would probably feel like a step back since I've played the more current games. Uh, unlike Grimmoth's LPs of 4 and 6, there wouldn't be nostalgia value because I didn't. I'd, it would be my first time playing any of these older games. So I'll go back and play an older game without a nostalgia factor. Suddenly, the things that wouldn't matter to me if it was a nostalgia game, like the graphics aren't as good as what I'm used to, and there aren't as many options, and there aren't as many officers, would be a problem. So I'm not going to do it. Um, now we get down to effing controller. I think he's a Voltron Army guy. I think I've seen his icon on the Voltron Army, but I don't really remember him making a lot of comments. But he asked me quite a few questions, which is nice. There's a... Uh, picture from a helicopter. I've got a ton of pictures similar to this, but I figured I'd just throw in one. Um, FN Controller, I'm still going through your website libraries. I apologize in advance if you address any of these questions, blah, blah, blah. What got you started on this hobby? I think I answered that. Um, so I will not switch pictures. Do you plan on doing any streams? Have you done any? Well, that's a question. I'll switch pictures. 
There's a picture of Kath's famous poop pond with some of the signs. You can't see it that well, but the one on the left says Area 50 Poo, which is... I laughed really hard the first time I saw that sign, and then I realized how stupid it was, because it's not even Area 52, it's Area 51. So the joke kind of doesn't make sense, but uh, the green weird-looking thing hanging off it, that was an inflatable plastic alien, um, and I think it deflated, so... The biohazard sign is the only actual official sign. The rest of them are signs that were put up by soldiers for fun. Uh, do you plan on doing any streams? Have you done any? Um, no, and no. I don't really know anything about doing streams. I think I know what streams are. I obviously can't watch them here. That's when somebody actually uh, has like live LP and content. I know there's a couple of famous LPers who would have like some kind of chat window open and they'd split screen so you could watch them play a game and there was a chat window where people could comment while they play and uh, I've seen something similar to that Riff Track said something similar to that that whole idea I don't know the, it, it doesn't do anything for me doing it like with the chat window and stuff like that but um, to let people kind of feel like they're participating or whatever but uh, I don't suppose it's out of the question that I might do some but I certainly can't do them from here I don't have the internet capabilities uh, and I've never really seen the point, so unless people start asking for it, it's it's unlikely. Uh, next question. There's generic. I don't know. I just like the shot because of the way the mountains look in the background. Though you can barely see them, and a bunch of um, MRAPs with snow on them. Obviously, that is not the camp where I spend most of my time. That was a camp I was visiting up in the in the mountain region. Um, Probably a cheesy question, but what's your absolute favorite game? I guess I kind of already talked about that, and it took me forever, so let's not dwell on that anymore. Let's just keep going. Uh, and like I said, it was probably would have been Final Fantasy X before I started LPing it. Uh, not that it's not my favorite game, but the original, the question way up earlier in the list was, what's your favorite game you have in LP? So probably, I could say Final Fantasy X may be my favorite game, but it's, it probably isn't really. It's From a, a game that you play perspective, it, it has huge problems. It's incredibly linear. Very straightforward, kind of dull gameplay, but I really love the story a lot, so uh, let's go ahead and throw that back up there. And maybe that one's my favorite. Sure, why not? I noticed that you mentioned Ireland in some of your videos. I took a trip there about a year ago and sort of fell in love with it. Can you tell us more about your travels there? I could. Um, there's not really that much to tell. Both of my parents are from Ireland. Not like they're Irish Americans, but they're actually from Ireland. So uh, my siblings and I are actually first generation immigrants. Um, and for some reason when I talk about that people think that I'm like bragging about it that I think I'm better than they are for that reason I don't want to like come off that way but I've, I've had somebody like really get in my face about it one time it kind of surprised me that I was talking about well my family's Irish and I started telling a story and they're like they just thought I was being like a punk that I was better than them because I was Irish and they were American I don't know but um, no my family's from there so going there is kind of odd because there's family there that you're sort of you know I don't know them that well because I don't spend a lot of time around them but they're family so you're supposed to kind of be close with them and uh, and they're always really nice but when I go there uh, the part that's usually the most fun is uh, driving around and seeing different parts of the country and um, had a really good seafood meal uh, last time I was there this place where they had seafood chowder where it was like it could have been the main course it was like not just a ton of liquid with a little bit of meat in it. It was just really good seafood chatter. So that's really an exciting story, isn't it? One time I went to Ireland and had seafood chatter. <laughs> the guy who got in my face about how I about how I was from Ireland, he, he'd asked me, he was going to he was going to go to Dublin and he wanted to watch and, and he said, well you've been to Ireland, right? Well I'm going to Dublin. I'm going to watch a Notre Dame game. Isn't that awesome? Can you tell me any good bars over there? And I'm like, <laughs> Dublin? You want me to tell you a good bar in Dublin? Just turn around. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, last time I was there, we I went. With, I was there driving around with my parents, and anytime I, they would ask me if I wanted to see something, and if any, and it seemed like everything I suggested uh, got vetoed. Like, oh, would you like, you know, well, would you like to see this? Yeah, I'd like to see that. Oh well, we're not going to be able to get there. It was kind of weird, but um, we did see the Ring of Kerry, and that's gorgeous. It's a country with a lot of beautiful scenery, so. I don't really don't have anything specific to tell you about wacky anecdotes or anything. Uh, any anecdotes I have would be about family, and I don't really feel like talking about that on my LP channel. So, okay, let's keep going. There's a uh, KFC. It's not as nice as uh, Pizza Hut, but 
you can see it there. Isn't that nice? Oh, and you can see, you probably can't read it, but that box in the foreground is Diva Water, which is my least favorite uh, of the uh, bottled in the uh, UAE waters that we get to drink here. Um, where does the magic come from? Or more seriously, what's your recording schedule like, and how do you approach making an LP? Well, in Afghanistan, the recording schedule is if I... If it's not during hours where I'm really supposed to be working, because, uh, you know, sometimes I don't work when I'm supposed to be working, uh, if there's nothing in particular to work on, but I can't bring myself to LP when I'm on the clock. That's just a bit much. But uh, during the evenings, I'll LP. Uh, we don't really have weekends over here because you're kind of on call seven days a week, so it's not like it would be at home. Uh, but here, I'll, I'll LP in the evenings, and I've... I've mentioned this in videos. I don't know. Right now, I've got time to record, and I've got a lot of time to record, so I never know how much longer I'm going to have time to record. Um, you know, because my living arrangements might change. I might get a roommate. Um, I might lose access to the internet that's allowing me to send files to Bobo to upload on my behalf. So right now, I'm just recording a lot, and um, it's kind of a problem, actually. It's much easier to record here than it is to watch anything. So the problem is that I'm recording faster than I really believe that any of my subscribers are possibly interested in watching, uh, and I'm staggering my output to, like, one R2K video a day. But now I have to stop recording that because I'm getting comments, giving me feedback and useful advice, uh, and I've already recorded another 10, 12, 20, you know, who knows how many videos past the point that you're seeing, and... Uh, that's a problem. So, uh, back in the states, my schedule—I I would sometimes uh, set my mind on during the day. I'd be like, you know, I'm going to go home and I'm going to record some tonight. But invariably, when I got back from work and have made myself some dinner, I never really have the energy to record during the week uh, unless I can stay up super late. So I would usually record a lot on Friday nights, and then during the day on Saturday or Sunday, I would usually find time to record. And like I said before, uh, the the danger is that if you spend all of your free time recording and you never get out of the house, then, like me, you're just single and you're not getting any younger, you don't want to die alone and afraid, but, um, hey, man, that's the risk. As for how do I approach an LP, um, how do I approach making an LP, I really don't know how to, how to answer that question. I don't really think I have an approach, uh, unless it's an LP together with Bobo. Uh, at this point, I haven't done an LP together with anybody else, but let's an LP together with Bobo, or I have to talk with him about, you know, do you think this is a good idea? Do you think we could do anything with this before we start? Otherwise, uh, if I know, I'll think about games that I've enjoyed, and I'll think about whether or not other people would probably enjoy watching it, whether or not I could bring anything to it that I don't think anyone else has done, or that I think I could do better than anyone else has done, or if it's just a game that I know I'd really enjoy playing, even if it's not my most popular LP. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've played a lot of games that I don't think had anybody else had LP'd, and, uh, and if I know I'm going to start LP'ing a game, oh, you know, next weekend I'm going to start recording Final Fantasy X, then I'll probably think through parts of the game that I remember, and, you know, try to think of something funny to say there, but generally there's no real big preparation, I just sit down and start recording, so. Okay. Effing Controller wrote me a lot of questions. So this one is, who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? Um, probably Raphael. Um, when I played the game, sorry, when I watched the cartoon, um, I was I think it was just, it's one of the last Saturday morning cartoons I remember watching, because I was think I was just getting a little too old to really still care about Saturday morning cartoons. Certainly, I was no longer young enough that it was like a big, exciting highlight of the week, Saturday morning. Um, but um, I was old enough by the time that show came on to recognize that Michelangelo was just a freaking awful composite of everything that the marketers at this toy company thought that little kids would think was cool. So I hated Michelangelo a lot. Um, and Leonardo and Donatello were both just freaking boring. So I liked Raphael because he was like the sarcastic uh, one. Uh, the video games, of course, uh, the NES game, Donatello is the best, easily. And I don't think it really matters much in the arcade games. Uh, if I went back and watched it again... I remember one of the things I liked about that show was that in the early episodes, uh, when Bebop, Bebop and Rocksteady were first introduced, they were like a real threat. I think they just became 
comic stooges by the end of it. But when they were first introduced, the turtles kind of had to outsmart them because if they went up in a straight up fight with them, they would get owned, uh, and that got lost pretty quickly. But uh, in the early episodes of the series, all four of them together were a match for Shredder. But if any one of the turtles went up against Shredder one on one, Shredder would wipe the floor with them, which I thought was pretty cool, because uh, it was a change of pace from when I was a kid watching Transformers, the Decepticons almost always retreat in a straight-up fight with the Autobots, which is why the Transformers, the movie, was so surprising, in a way, uh, with Optimus Prime versus Megatron, but also uh, G.I. Joe Cobra would just retreat the first time things started going even a little bit against them, so it's pretty cool when Shredder used to be able to whoop up on the Turtles, but uh, that's not the question. The question is, who's your favorite Ninja Turtle? The answer is Raphael, uh, except that if I went back and watched it now, it would probably be Leonardo, because of the fact that he was voiced by the guy who did the voice of Liquid Snake, but um, it would boast mostly, if I was watching it now, I would just occasionally be screaming, Snake! and not really paying attention to the show. Uh, the next question from Effing Controller is, Kona Crush or Demolition Crush? Um... Not to be a smart aleck, but actually my favorite is neither. It's uh, Foreign Fanatics Crush, when Crush wore purple, silver, and black face paint and like a spiral pattern on his face. And was accompanied to the ring by Mr. Fuji, who was waving a Japanese flag, because Kona Crush temporarily decided he hated America. <laughs> it's fantastic. The Foreign Fanatics were great, because he had uh, Yokozuna, who was actually American. Um, I think he was Samoan. He might have been... Maybe he wasn't American, but he was uh, he definitely wasn't actually Japanese. And then uh, you had Ludwig Borga, who was a legit Finn, but Finland was not an enemy of America, so that didn't make any sense. And then you had the Quebecers, who were just not quite as cool as the Fabulous Rougeau brothers, but obviously since one of them was one of the Fabulous Rougeau brothers, it was pretty much along the same lines. They were dressed as Mounties, and they cheated. <laughs> and apparently they hated America by virtue of the fact that they weren't American. So the foreign fanatics were pretty awesome. And... Um, if I had to choose between Kona Crush and Demolition Crush, I guess I would choose Kona Crush, because I find it just hilarious that his whole gimmick was... You were supposed to like him, he was a fan favorite, but he was just a big guy from Hawaii. That's all. That's his whole story, his whole personality. And, like, you were supposed to care about him for that reason. <laughs> okay. Uh, change the picture again. This is one of my favorites. I hope you can read it. Um, I, had to, I had two pictures of this, and the other one... Uh, is farther back and shows you more of the sign, but it also has the name of the tech sergeant who was running the show, and uh, I didn't want to put his name on there. Um, but yeah, this is an actual real sign that was up at the uh, Leatherneck Weight Gym. I don't think it was meant to be a joke. Uh, anyway, and uh, Effing Controller now says, and for the requisite James Lipton questions, what's your favorite word? My favorite word is nomenclatural, which means ever related to the science of naming things. Nomenclatural. Uh, next picture. That is the car dealership outside of the Leatherneck MCX. I have a better, it's, it's amazing to me there is a car dealership. Uh, this is for ordering a car that will be waiting for you when you get back to America. They don't actually sell Fords and Jeeps uh, that you can drive around on the base. Better picture of the Levin Exchange than that, but it has a bunch of people's faces that you could probably pick out and identify. That guy in the bottom left corner, right? this picture, I don't think you could tell who he was. Anyway, but uh, I didn't want to put pictures in with people's faces. So, uh, Next question is, what is your least favorite word? Probably the C word. Um, I don't really like uh, it when people get freaked out about the use of an individual word. Uh, I mean, multiple words in combination, that's the basis of literature and writing, and I'm a big fan of reading. So obviously, if uh, words in combination didn't really me make any impact on me, then I wouldn't be a fan of reading. But individual words shouldn't really do much for you. I mean, it's infuriating to me that people would want to ban uh, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn because it's got the N-word in it. The fact that I'm even saying the N-word is kind of ridiculous, considering that in my own uh, LPs I've used the phrase, we'll come up for you, nigga, before, but, um, no, people want to ban The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn because it's got the N-word, and I think that's ridiculous. I happen to like that book, but I think if you've read it, you could legitimately take offense at a lot of stuff. Uh, the character that everyone's upset about because it's part of his name, Nigger Jim, you could certainly be offended by that character and think that that was an awful way to have the only black character in the book, really. Well, the only one who's appears in multiple scenes, I suppose. Um, you could be really upset about that. You could be upset about messages that the book is spreading. I think you could make 
arguments that the book is overrated and shouldn't be taught. It sh students should not be told that it's a great American novel or that it's a contender for that. Um, I think it is a contender for that, but I can see a legitimate argument being made against that. But it's really frustrating to me that people get so worked up about an N-word or any other specific swear word um, that that would be a problem. Uh, so to the point where they don't even teach Huckleberry Finn in school. Kids read a short, generally read a like an episode from Tom Sawyer, which is a much, which is a fun book, but it's a much lesser book from a literary perspective, because we feel like we should teach Twain, but we don't want to teach anything that's controversial. So if I don't have a problem with curse words, then why is my least favorite word the c word? Well, you've got to pick something. And I found myself being really surprised when I heard it being used casually in the UK. In the UK, it is much less of a stigmatized word than it is in America. Uh, it's not a big deal to use it in America. I mean, it is a big deal to use it in America. It's a really big deal. HBO shows and, like, The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and shows like that that have a lot of fun with using swear words because they air at a certain time at night and are on cable generally stay away from that word for... Um, probably because possibly for Jon Stewart it might be because it comes across as sexist and he's you know fairly liberal friendly um, but in the UK it's not a big deal and when I heard it used there on like UK uh, I mean I, I think I heard Ricky Gervais using it on some Ricky Gervais show stuff and I was kind of really surprised that I had a strong visceral reaction against it and it's probably just because it's not used much in the States so since it actually does have some power left as a word that people just don't use it was disturbing to hear it used and also it refers to something that um, as a heterosexual male, your thoughts towards this thing should generally be pleasant. You don't want to spend all day going around thinking about female genitals, but when you do think about them, it should be a relatively pleasant thought, and that word just kind of makes them sound icky. So that's enough about the C word.